Well, welcome everyone. It is great to see so many of you um, with us this evening. Um, we're just going to be letting people uh, in to join us online. They'll be joining, uh, joining the webcast. So we've got people in the room today, people joining us through the webcast, and it's great to have, um, yeah, just to have you all here. This is the last lecture in this series, the President's um, uh, Lectures. Um, I'm going to remind our in-person audience that we would like you to wear masks this evening. Um, although masks are no longer required uh, in uh, indoor settings, um, we do have uh, the opportunity to request that masks are used at particular events. And for this evening, we'd like you to continue wearing your masks. Um, so thank you very much. And we really do appreciate your cooperation. So um, my name is Joy, Joy Johnson, and it's really my distinct pleasure to be the president of Simon Fraser University. And I wanna begin this evening in a good way. And so to do that, it's my honor to invite Elder Margaret George, a member of the Swahalik First Nation to offer a traditional welcome. And she will join us online. Thank you for taking the time to come to this very special event and thanking everybody from each community to be aware of what is happening. Thanking all the SFU family for taking part. Just a quick prayer and you can get your event going. Great Spirit, thank you for bringing us together. Just guide each and every one of us on the path that we are on, always clearing our minds before we even speak. I ask Great Spirit, to bless all the elders in our community and especially the young ones who witness what we do as we are the leaders and the mentors of those who follow us. I ask Great Spirit just a very special blessing on each and every one present, especially the president who is doing a very good job for us. Great Spirit, thank you for inviting me, all my relations. Well, thank you very much, um, Elder Margaret. I always appreciate Elder Margaret telling me I'm doing a good job. We all need that kind of affirmation from time to time. Uh, and I do want to acknowledge that I am privileged to be speaking you, to you today um, from the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And it's really important um, um, to be thinking about the lands we're on and um, our privilege of being able to gather on these lands. And I do wanna pay my respect to elders past and present. So uh, here we are, uh, the president's faculty lecture with uh, Dr. June Francis, who is going to shortly address us on the subject of becoming an anti-racist decolonized university. What does it mean and what will it take? And I'm really looking forward to this evening. As many of you know, um, the president's faculty lectures are part of the SFU Public Square, a signature initiative of our vision to be Canada's engaged university. And by providing um, opportunities to all of you um, to hear and engage uh, with leading researchers and scholars, um, we really um, welcome um, this opportunity. They're really uh, lecture series really are designed to enlighten, to promote dialogue uh, on important issues of public interest. And I can think of no better topic than the one this evening. This is the last in the series of six lectures um, in the 2021 um, series, uh, or 2021, 2022 series um, that have explored the themes of equity, justice from a variety of different disciplines. It's a really fitting topic for our times. I think you can all agree. And it's been a great way for us to share ideas and to connect. So we are broadcasting live from the David Mofagian World Art Center at SFU Woodward's in downtown Vancouver. And I wanna thank uh, the SFU Woodward's team at the back of the room, uh, amazing team for their AV and technical support and to accurate real time for providing closed captioning um, and so those of you who are on Zoom can access the closed captioning um, by pressing the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And if you have any problems, um, please send a message to hosts and panelists and someone will help you out. So we are happy to be once to get again together in person. I was talking to June earlier and this is one of her first events to be in person and it feels slightly surreal, but we're learning our way um, as we um, try to find our way out of these COVID times. 
So for the question and answer period this evening, and there will be a question and answer period, we're gonna be using some technology called Slido. Slido, so I will encourage all of you to take your phones out and find Slido. Uh, it's a site, it's a website that you can easily access on your phone or on your computer. Uh, you don't need to sign up for account or anything like that. And um, so I encourage those of you who are joining us online, those of you in the room, um, to ask your questions through this technology. And to do that, all you do is go to Slido, S-L-I.D-O, uh, uh, in your web browser and then enter the six digit code that you see here, 151020. And so you can submit your questions um, at any time um, during the event. And then I'll be going through them. I'll be asking some questions at the beginning, having a conversation with June, but we'll bring you all into the conversation through your questions and you can upvote other people's questions as well. Um, I do wanna remind you that we have community guidelines, um, which will also uh, be posted in the chat. Uh, and above all, there's just no tolerance, as you all know, for those who promote violence or discrimination against others um, on the basis of race, ethnicity, national uh, origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, religious affiliation, age or disability. Uh, and anyone who incites harm um, uh, will be removed at the discretion of the event hosts. So uh, finally, please also note that this lecture is being recorded and will be available on the SFU Public Square website and YouTube channel. So that's the housekeeping taken care of. And so with no further ado, it's now my pleasure to introduce our lecturer tonight, Dr. June Francis. Uh, Dr. June Francis, PhD, MBA, LLB, is the co-founder of the Co-Laboratorio, CoLab and special advisor to me, uh, the president of Simon Fraser University on anti-racism and the director of the SFU Institutes for Diaspora Research and Engagement. She's the co-founder of the Black Caucus at Simon Fraser University and an associate professor in the Beattie School of Business. She's also the chair of the board of the directors of Hogan's Alley Society an organization whose mission it is to advance the economic and cultural well being of people of African descent through the delivery of housing, built spaces, and programming. She's an advocate for equity, diversity, and inclusion for racialized groups, as well as human rights, through her research, consulting, media appearances, and volunteering. June's extensive experience spans the private sector, the public sector, nationally, regionally, and locally, as an entrepreneur with civil society on governance boards, and of course, as an academic. June has been recognized by the province of British Columbia and the National Congress of Black Women as a trailblazer and was named to Vancouver Magazine's 2022 Power List, Power 50 List. The city of Vancouver has also recognized her for her contributions to education and to the city. She's the recipient of the 2021 Rosemary Brown Award for her exemplary work to bring equality for girls and women, both nationally and internationally, and the Service Award from the Beatty School of Business for her contributions to the community, among other accolades. So please join me. I'm really looking forward to this evening. Please join me in welcoming Dr. June Francis. picture of my family. It's not often I get to see them <laughs> together in the same space. It is such a pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, you know, when I first joined Simon Fraser University, oh, I, I think it's uh, at least 30 years ago, um, I was a child bride. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I was asked to give a president's lecture, and I didn't. I, 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 I was advised that I should really work on my tenure and, and the frivolity of giving this lecture. Well, that was the first of many, many pieces of advice that I learned not to take. And so this time when Joy um, asked me to do this lecture, I, um, I realized uh, that this was uh, a moment. And uh, I want to, by the way, um, 
uh, walk back my joke about being a child. I meant to say a child. The word bride came out. That was not something I think is funny at all. And so I walked that back from the very beginning. We all make these horrible mistakes. Um, so today I am delighted. Uh, I want to say that um, this topic is daunting. Uh, I was daunted by it. And uh, I hope uh, somewhere in this lecture, I'll be able to uh, at least uh, provide some valuable information for those who have uh, come, as well as those many people who have joined me online. But I really appreciate your presence here. And as Joy said, it's surreal to be in the actual presence of others. So if I try to, um, if I try to share my screen, uh, forgive me. I would like to, <laughs> introduce myself in another way as well, which is that um, I am the seventh child of Aston and Ivy Francis, whose love and guidance and teachings I am forever grateful for and will always acknowledge uh, the enormous impact they had on my life uh, as a child and as growing up in Jamaica, because I am a stolen person. Uh, I say that because my ancestors were, of course, stolen, transported across uh, in, in barbaric conditions and uh, were subject to enormous, enormous barbarity on the island of, of, of Jamaica. So I am grateful to my ancestors whose survival and struggle uh, meant my very survival. And I'm always I'm in full recognition of the price they paid uh, for me to stand here today. I am also wanted to pay honor and homage to the Taino First Nations, uh, uh, whose land Aixamaica uh, is a name uh, Jamaica um, uh, is it derives from, and it means the island of spring. So. Uh, many it did not survive the uh, genocide that took place. Uh, many survive in the bloodlines of the Maroon people who were never ever enslaved by the British and who fought vigilantly against the uh, uh, colonization in my country. And I pay homage to um, the, the woman at the top with that expression is my mother. The, the picture in the top left is the, my father, who was a journalist, who I'll refer to later. Um, um, and the guidance of and, 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 and real insight my mother had uh, that her daughters especially, but all her children would, would be educated. So I, I take education and the topic of education quite seriously uh, because my mother did. She was not entitled to it. She did not, get, uh, she was, did not enjoy the privilege of ed education, but she saw to it that we got, turns out to be a colonial education, but it was the only one on offer. And I do want to uh, talk to, uh, remind us uh, uh, myself of Nanny of the Maroons. Uh, she was a heroine uh, who fought the British uh, to the point where they eventually signed a treaty. Uh, and so I remember her struggle uh, to free uh, many, many slaves in Jamaica, enslaved people. Now, I, I, you know, as a young woman growing up, I uh, often um, listened to the words of uh, Bob Marley, uh, Jamaica embodied in their bodies. Uh, as a slave society, uh, many, uh, we were not allowed to write. We were denied the opportunity to read, although many learned anyway. Um, but on the pain of death. Uh, so we learn to embody in our bodies and in our memories um, uh, our, 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 our history. And we passed on this history orally and we passed it on through dance and it, we passed it on through song. So many of our songs herald our condition. And no, no, there's one person who has done this exceptionally well, uh, Bob Marley. And I ask you to join me in listening to a song where he names mental slavery. And I will, I will be talking about uh, universities as sites of mental slavery. And so I ask you to just join with me in listening to the words of my compatriot um, who died at a very young age. This was the last song he ever wrote. 
Um, so uh, I just ask that uh, we play his song at this time. This, all we ever had were redemption songs. And I ask you, and I hope when you leave here today, you will sing with us these songs of freedom. Today, I'm going to talk about a, a variety of things. And as I looked at that again, I remembered why I put how ambitious this agenda is. We only have a few minutes today and I'll do my best, but this is a conversation that's going to try to undo 400 years of oppression. So as you can see, this is, no, this is a tall order. I hate to have to do this, but I recognize we're not there yet. I, I wanna get to the point where I no longer have to ask the question, are universities colonial and racist? Uh, I, I want to get there where that no longer is the starting point, but I don't know that we're there, so I will start there. I will then go on to focus on some of um, my own work to illustrate the journey, the journey that I have taken to address anti-racism and decolonization in my own work. I use these examples in research, in classroom, in student life, in governance and administration, and perhaps, but I doubt I'll get to it, in my volunteer work. And I'm giving these examples not because of, you know, I intend to self-aggrandize, but I want to share with you my own journey as I try to make space in the hostility of the act academic world that I experienced as a space of a hostility, of racial hostility. And the reason I'm sharing it with you is because I think we all have a responsibility as listeners uh, to take what I say to whatever way it can help to deepen your understanding, but I ask you to commit to action. To always remember that despite the color of my skin, I was subject to the same colonial education. And so as I've, I've tried to find space of liberation in my own work, I encourage you all to find that space in your own work. We know we have to topple the edifices, we know that. But as part of that work, um, Every day, everything we do will contributes to that work. So I remember, you know, Marley invites us to remember the roots of slavery because without understanding that old pirates robbed I and sold I to the, uh, to the merchant ships, that we came, uh, many of us, uh, the, the two groups that were fundamentally subjected to the, the logic of colonization were indigenous people whose lands were dispossessed in this country and globally, and, who, and, and, and the African people whose liberties and bodies and labor they were dispossessed of. And so Afua Kupo, who I am happy to say, uh, we have um, extended the honor of an, uh, of an honorary degree that she will receive later this fall. One of the greatest historians Canada has ever seen um, reminds us always that we have to 
uh, go back to the legacy of, uh, if we want to understand today's world, we have to go back to the legacy and the systems of power and oppression on which the agency of white suppression, uh, oppression and supremacy rest. Because you see universities and are fundamentally about ideas. Mental slavery required in order to subject us, and I will say universities have been uh, foundational to building and, and, and supporting when our bodies were no longer enslaved, ideas were, and oppression was primarily wielded through the violence of mental slavery. And universities and the educational system was, was, was instrumental. It wasn't by accident. Uh, it was intended to main maintain the obedience of people who look like me. And so killing our prophets, if we could not kill their words, many times we literally killed them. Malcolm X, we tried to kill Mandela. Bob Marley had his life, uh, an attack on his life. Um, and of course we know what MLK had. But let me just say in universities every day, prophets are being killed by the erasure of our work, by the silencing at conference, by the ways in which our pedagogy and and are uh, 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 denied us. And so the profits that we kill, we continue to kill through a, a, a very active process of erasure. I bring this slide to you to remind us that sli silencing black and other voices of dissension was always a colonial strategy. My father, and I pay homage to him because as I grew up, he reminded me and always talked about the power of words. He was a journalist very early. He worked with uh, Marcus Garvey at the newspaper called The Black Man, where Marcus Garvey, because of his words, uh, was charged with sedition and libel. And he was uh, sentenced to jail. Marcus Garvey, the great Pan-Africanist, he never had to serve David, it was overturned. But on the other side, you will see um, a newspaper clipping of my father who had to uh, serve as witness to try and defend the newspaper he was editing against another charge of seditious libel because the silencing of the colonized, the colonized people was active. It was not a passive thing. It was strictly enforced. Universities are therefore intended as sites to reproduce slavery. And this slavery is to the Eurocentric epistemologies that we teach. And I'm gonna quote here um, couples who said, the Western university is a site where the production of knowledge is embedded in Eurocentric epistemologies that are posited as objective, Dis disembodied and universal, and in which non Eurocentric knowledge, such as Black and Indigenous ones, are largely marginalized or dismissed. Consequently, it is an institution that produces racism, sexism, and this word I want you to remember epistemic violence. It promotes indigenous dispossession and black sub subjugation. And it's a narrative that supports the idea that all things civilized, advanced, enlightened, and innovative must come from European sources. Most revered enlightenment thinkers who still get taught at this university, we look at Voltaire, the term enlightenment, let's just unpack that one of these days. The Negro race is a species of men as different from us as a breed of spaniels is from greyhounds. How does that hit your ears? 
if there were, I won't read it, the rest of it in the interest of time. I think that's enough. I am not apt to suspect that the Negroes and all in general, uh, and all in general are other species of men to be naturally inferior to white. I am apt to suspect that the Negro is in general naturally, naturally inferior to whites. And it goes on. Locke, the great John Locke owned slaves, participated in slavery. These are people that we continue. These are the dead white men that we revere. At the same time, black scholars were silenced. Let's be clear on that. Sometimes we have the idea that black scholars didn't exist. Or as we hear, it's hard to find them. This is W.E.B. Du Bois, 1895, Harvard graduate, PhD, never got a job in academics, never got a full-time job in academics. He is regarded now as the greatest sociologist that has ever lived, all of his work outside of academia. And you know what else happened? They're now beginning to realize that much of the work in academia that has been accredited to other people was based on his own work. Silence erased, etc. Capitalism and Slavery, a text that was written in 1938 by Eric Williams, who would become Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. I see a Trinidadian in the room here. I call you out. Um, <laughs> um, capitalism and slavery, because he dared to point out that the wealth in Europe was derived from the enslavement and the colonization of people. And in 1938, the heresy of this thesis meant that it was never published in Oxford. And this year, this year, they finally decided to publish it again. The philosophical basis on which the academy rests is one which functions to privilege knowledge emanating from European thinkers. I can't say this enough, to legitimate European belief system, histories, ideologies, principles, and literature. And when we look at what's in front of us, the Benin sculpture, if you ever have a chance to see these sculptures that were robbed, uh, uh, from, stolen from the continent, uh, the kingdom of the great kingdom of Benin, and you, you see them. And of course, this is what was said at the time. We were at once astonished at such an unexpected find and puzzled to account for such a highly developed art form among a race so entirely barbarous. The Haitian Revolution, and I could go on, was never, ever allowed to be really understood as the first great and one of the greatest revolutions of all time. Formerly enslaved people beat back the Europeans and claimed the land. And to this day, we, we have, Haiti has paid for that audacity beyond the fact that they continued to pay Europe for the right to exist. And we, we, we hallow, and there's nothing wrong with the French Revolution, but we're left to believe that, in fact, is the only revolution worth studying. Black exclusion and it, Black and Indigenous exclusion is not a historical fact. It shows up today in universities. If you look at this chart and you look at two um, columns, the very dark column um, to the, the ones that are really low on the left hand side of my screen are the black and indigenous people, right? We don't exist as university leaders. 
If you look at any university, look at the leadership structure. It's not by accident. And this is not, of course, attributed to individuals. It's a system we're talking about here. It's a system that intentionally privileged some people. It's not about individuals. It's about the systemic uh, structures that did that. And if you look at full-time faculty, this should appall you. Doctorate degrees, and as you go towards undergraduates, you see that and graduate degrees that black and indigenous people are going to universities. And there's a lot of work that shows that it's not for want of entering these spaces. You know, I'm gonna share with you after I, I finish this slide, why I realized I had no choice but to decolonize my work and, to, and to, to ensure that in everything I do and every breath I had, that I address the issues of exclusion, whatever platform I was given in life. You know, I didn't have the pleasure of, uh, the privilege of growing up in a family that allowed me to think that whatever gifts I got were for myself. Jamaican culture, it's very clear that your mother says to you day one, if you're bright or smart or even pretty, none of that matters. None of that matters. What only matters is how you use that gift. And that gift is not for you. It's for what you bring to the world. It is your obligation. It is your obligation. And we look at this equity myth, and it's a book that was published by a group of scholars that I think really made the case that I, I think is so important here is that visible minority professors are underrepresented. We know that, we see that. We know that this is still true, even though Canadian universities have been, if you look on SFU's website, it says that we are something like, we're a equity employer, you know? We are, I always say, how do we know that? Like, how did we know that? Where do we get that from? We just say it, you get to make this up or what? I, I just wonder. And you see it across the world, every university is a, we are a something or the other. Uh, we just kind of invent it. And, uh, but when you look on average, what you find is as racialized scholars publish more journal articles and acquire more grants, but they're paid less. This should, this should, this should really land. Because you see, most universities say things like, but we hire the best, really, and we promote the best. As long as you are white, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. But that's the point. And, and, and coming back to why this work, why I committed myself to this work. When I went to the University of Washington as a young doctoral student, I was just there to do my PhD like everybody else. I was desperately trying to do something on a black topic. That's a topic for another day, never got to do it. But nonetheless, um, I was approached by a group of black students at the university. And they said to me, you're the only person in the entire university we trust. And we're asking you to work with the university to daylight the way in which the business school has systematically excluded us. And what I found was bone chilling. These, these students, many of whom had come from rather poor circumstances, but had ex exemplary qualifications, would come to the business school and would, turned away, would be turned away by gatekeepers who suggested to them that they probably should go elsewhere. I wrote that report. I hope it made a difference. Another event happened to be at UBC years later. As I went up there to do my PhD, and many of you have heard me tell this story, I was met with the same thing at UBC. I was told that I should probably recognize how hard it is to do a PhD in business at UBC. Nobody asked me my, my qualifications and I never went back uh, to UBC. That's how I ended up at the University of Washington. 
And the third instance was at the University of Washington. As I sat in my desk, I'd been away for about a year. Um, after I had had a child and had gone back uh, to the university. And a woman who is a custodial staff came up to me and she said, you're still here, she said. And she said, they didn't get rid of you. They didn't get rid of you. Here is a woman I'd never noticed. And I realized from then on that I had to know every person who worked or walked past my office for the rest of my life, because I realized that I too had not noticed her. But what she said to me was, we were all hoping for you. We want to see you succeed. We're, we're putting our hopes in you. A woman who had never met, really met me before. I recognize that in all we do, we are prophets and we cannot stand aside and watch. So universities end up with uh, racialized and indigenous people experiencing universities as sites of trauma. As I said to you uh, early, as you heard earlier, Henry, James, there, Eben, there are a lot of people who came together and formed the Black Caucus here at Simon Fraser University. And what I realized, sadly, in those talks, and uh, Balkis is here as one of the founding members too, um, from Soka. Um, when I heard the trauma of faculty, of staff, of students that summer, as we went through these meetings, I realized that 30 years later, those stories were the same stories that I'd heard at the University of Washington. That, it, that this, is this is an intractable problem. It's a systemic problem. And I remember the trauma, I, my own trauma, I, I tried to visualize it as that. The sense of, I don't belong here. Everyone is saying things to me, except the things that make my heart sing. I cannot bring my own intellect, my own worldview. I'm constantly being asked to put it aside, to not talk about racism if I wanna succeed. Um, Talk about economics. I knew I couldn't do it. But as I looked to summer, summer 2020, as Black Lives Matter protests uh, engulfed our country, cities, one of the things that I really give homage to is that this one man, um, not just one, of course, he, there, this is an ongoing slaughter of, of Black men and, 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 and Black women. Um, indigenous women in, and, and men in this country, you know, the murder and misses women, that it, 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 it galvanized uh, North America and it did galvanize Canadian society. And it spilled over into the streets and academics started talking and, and talking about a, a national conversation as we started to compare notes about the way in which racialized faculty uh, did not feel that their work was being properly um, included, uh, and that's a mild way of putting it. And, and they emerged out of that was the Scarborough Charter and uh, Simon Fraser University, I'm happy to say, was one of the um, uh, signatories to this uh, uh, original charter, which aims to address anti-Black racism in universities um, and, and higher education. And it has some wonderful principles, but, we also saw the toppling of university institutionally racist symbols, Ryerson University, the architect of, of the residential school system, Ludwig, who was uh, Lud Law, whose name was on the University of New Brunswick Law School, um, who was a, you know, own, was a, a, a own slaves along with the present, you know, the own, the, um, founder of McGill and other places, Dal Lord Dalhousie, that, that suddenly these things were being talked about even at SFU, finally, finally. We didn't think it was, a, we, we saw, you know, after years of saying 
Do you really think black students and faculty and staff thinks it's okay to say that our student um, uh, 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 sports team is called the Klansmen? And you're gonna tell us that it's spelled differently? I mean, who comes up with this? You can't make this up, right? And so we hung on to it. Is this the time I ask that we topple all of that? And we stop, I love the pipe band. I gotta tell you, I, I, love, I love pipe music, but is this a time where the drummers come in and the indigenous and black drummers um, drum in our convocation? Has that time arrived? Do we always have to have homage to white, dead, black men forever? Nothing wrong with them. Uh, I'm just saying, there, there are some alternative paradigms as well. Emancipation will take a lot more than signatures. And that's where the but that I said earlier will come from. And Joy knows I speak about this all the time. Because it's so easy for all the universities to pile up and write statements, but 30 years later, we're back to where we are. So I wanna talk now about some of the ways in which I have used my work to encourage work. And I will talk about the other parts of the university. So now I switch from the problem to start to open up the space, to widen the space into a discussion of how do we reimagine the university? How do we reimagine our research? How do we reimagine our classrooms, our, our engagement with communities? How does the board of governors and the senate of the university uh, uh, engage to really topple uh, this very entrenched and longstanding and harmful, lit really harmful, uh, set of institutional practices. My own journey, so I, I will talk about this only because it's taken me a long time, uh, much of this time in conferences all around the world where I uh, would be a lonely person. I was silenced, I was often told because I dared to challenge my own field. I was told, you need letters. You won't get them unless you stop. It was subtle, sometimes overt. Sometimes I'm told it's not important. I've gone to, I remember one conference I, we went to where the black scholars were decided we're gonna give our own session in the business school. We were the only ones at our own session. We were literally the only ones at our own session. And I could see all of us realizing that if we wanted to get tenure, we needed to stop this. We wanted to pay for our mortgages. We needed to really think. So, this year, this past 20, year 2021, was my first year that I call my redemption song, my research song of freedom, because after many years of, 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 of giving these writing or having them rejected or giving these talks, I was invited by a major journal who had listened to one of my presentations and had realized that the field had nothing to offer during the Black Lives Matter protests. They had nothing they could draw on in the entire literature, more or less, that could show any links to these events. They were literally brought, they, they, you know, industry was getting rid of, you know, Aunt Jemima brands and, 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 and they were scrambling to figure out why it took, nobody had ever you know, suggested this in the literature before. What was going on? And they said, they invited me for the first time and said, here is a, you, we, we need you to look at our field. Give us your answer, give us your, write what you need to write. And for the first time I experienced academic freedom. I think they corrected three typos in that manuscript after reviewing it. 
And this following day after it was published, a scholar of color wrote me the one word. I never forget the feeling. It was published in the night and the next morning. All I got in my email was breathtaking. I, inter I, I, I used the opportunity to talk about the many ways in which or my own field had silenced the voice, had narrowed its, its vision, and had made itself irrelevant. You can read it, so I won't go into it. You give an academic a platform, you get a lot, so I, I won't even start. The other things that we did was my work at Hogan's Alley Society made it really clear to me the ways in which um, this, this ep ep epistemologies of white ignorance. And it's something I brought up in that paper. This notion that they'll, you, they publish on every topic around, everything around a topic, but the most central core element of racism. And it, in this case, it was housing. How does one speak about housing in North America and the history of the housing market and the, the institutions of the housing market and not go to the core of the whole story. The core of it is segregation. Segregation to create white property and white privilege as intentional strategies by business, by public officials with the intent of, of deciding because one of the things that white privilege gives is the a, is a ability to tell you where you can be and where you cannot be. And when you exist in white spaces, and so my son Joshua Roberts and I attacked this in a journal article, um, white spaces, how marketing actors reproduce marketplace in inequalities for black consumers. First time in the literature uh, that we had really gotten down to the core of racism in marketplaces. Think about that. Shopping while black. And it's not that this hadn't been touched on. It's just a way in which it's always skirted to the side. And white, and I call it white ignorance, right? We can we cover up our eyes that we didn't notice. We didn't notice racism in housing markets. Research, the other kind of approaches I've taken is research that directly addresses historical inequalities, power. Uh, uh, and power imbalances by employing anti-racist and decolonial methodology, this can be done. And it was published uh, um, last year in the journal, or in 2020, in the Journal of Development Studies, uh, where, where we, my um, co-author, uh, Christina Henriksen uh, and Jason Stewart, Alonzo, we, 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 we presented to the development studies world, a world that I'm going to shock you. You would think that people who are working with the global south would sort of look like the global south. I'm here to tell you, it's one of the whitest, most privileged. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. And then we, we claim, because uh, uh, we are white saviors, right? We are going to go down and tell people how to save themselves. And my colleague, James Butsui Sam often say, if we were to follow the world, the developing world, we would first commit genocide. So we should tell them that, first part. Second, slavery, okay? You extract people's, and we go on. And you create racial capitalism. And, all, and on and on, you exclude people. That's how you become wealthy because that is the truth of the wealth that we enjoy. The other thing is to engage in non-traditional research, the collaboratory, and Joy knows my long history. We're trying to get as of you to recognize this as research. If we're gonna engage with people who have not traditionally been part of the story, how do we do that without making sure that we don't do further harm? Much of this work involved collaborating with women 
try in, in, in areas that um, most remote parts of Peru and was always interested in this work in Peru, where they would tell us, why do you want to go up into that village? We can tell you all you, we know because you said Peru is a, is a society of what we call racial democracy. The denial of racism in Peru is epic. I was told that Afro-Peruvians, don't worry about that, until I met Afro-Peruvians. You don't have to worry about that. We don't treat, we, they're, 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 there's nothing. We're all Afro-Peruvians. But as a researcher, we've got to get behind that. Not easy work. And I remember the day that I was at a conference and many of these women came to the conference. They were invited and, and they weren't ready for me because they'd never seen anything like this. And as I stood up <laughs> and addressed, uh, you know, the politicians on the racial exclusion and the, 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 of, of indigenous women and, and the women's eyes were like, what on earth is this? And of course, in addition, I'm black. They'd never seen a black person do this. And I remember one man in one of our sessions getting up from his chair and he said, slowly, he said, I just want to acknowledge something today. And I thought he was going to say something like I, I, I wondered what was there going to be this revelation. I was hoping it wasn't something that was going to harm him. I was like, are you sure? Because of the way he did it. And he said, I am Afro-Peruvian. And he said, I see this woman standing on her blackness, and I am going to confess today that I am Afro, confess that I am Afro-Peruvian. Other work that disrupts where knowledge comes from, and I really am going to try not to go on much longer, but Mingolo, Mignolo, I always pronounced it wrong, um, is a decolonialist scholar, and I love the way he writes. As she writes, I think, I'm not quite sure. As we know, the first world has knowledge. Facetiously, this is being written. The third world has culture. We always can have culture. You know this? We love your culture. Um, and guess what? Native Americans have wisdom. We give them that. No land, just wisdom. And Anglo-Americans have science. So this is how knowledge is produced and that's where we look to. And so one of the publications here was we jumped on top of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I wrote, we wrote, wrote along with Lama Mugabo, a, a, a graduate of SFU who is a Rwandan as we tried to document the ways in which Rwanda actually used science and technology in addition to a whole range of other things to challenge the status quo. And in fact, kept COVID-19 at an incredible, we should have been looking to Rwanda for guidance. Some of the other work around newcomers and, and another paper I, 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 that we wrote around COVID-19 talking about new models for engagement. Um, uh, as well as documenting the ways in which COVID-19 would affect racialized immigrants and newcomers whose voice was not being heard in all of this. Recently, about a month ago, I, another publication came out saying rescuing marketing from its colonial roots, a decolonial anti-racist agenda. By the way, the previous article was written by um, uh, on COVID-19 with my colleagues, Christina, but the other one was written with my PhD student, um, uh, Stephanie Benninger. She's no longer my PhD student, but you know, once you're somebody's PhD student, we still say that, what's wrong with us? She's a perfectly liberated professor somewhere. Um, she was my PhD student. Um, Rescuing marketing from its colonial roots, a decolonial anti-racist agenda, where this is a type of research where I was trying to deeply dig into 
and illuminate how my own discipline had a colonial and racist root. And, to, and why have chocolate milk invented in Jamaica? Because it was, it was stolen by Lord Sloan who came. It's a long and horrible story. But think about it. Why, is the, why do we think the Italians have the best coffee when they grow no coffee? Think about what that colonial root says to you. Why do we accept these things and not ask? That's curious. Not one brand of chocolate that you know, that you know, comes from the continent of Africa where coca is produced. Indigenous knowledge, and I'm going to stop boring you right now, which is a lot set of papers you have to listen to. But again, interrogating knowledge systems that we ignore. And through, these are three papers, one, some in law, some in um, with my, you know, some, one is with my other son, David Robertson, and Stephanie Benninger and her sister. There's another one um, with Stephanie and I, and the third one uh, with uh, my, colleague Steph my, my colleague Stephanie Benninger, looking at traditional knowledge. And when she came to do her PhD, I said, we're in for it, Stephanie. You're going to be doing some interesting work. And she, was, she came here because she remembered my class. And she said, I've come here to do this. So this is where, here's the point I want to make here. We denigrate indigenous knowledge, right? We said it's, it's just folk wisdom, right? But yet we steal it and we make products out of it and we make money out of it. That is the, that is the subtlety you have to see because it was never ideologies of racism are about power. They're not real, right? They're about acquiring power for yourself. I'm gonna, in the interest, I'll run through this very quick classrooms, but I have to say something about students, right? I have to talk about the way in which our students come to the classrooms and recognize the ways in which they describe some of these experiences as trauma. We've got to work a lot across silos. This is a work I did within, the, within development studies. I literally became the director of the development studies. I stepped out of the coziness of the business school. Uh, I stepped into another space. I spent three years. I taught the graduate school and this is not to aggrandize me. It was to break free of the colonial silos because how the abstractionism we have in universities, it, we, it is a knowledge system, right? That says certain things like you have English and the, the arts and you never speak to the mathematician. This is a knowledge, this is a special epistemology. And so we brought students together in Peru, we had students connected with their communities. Another way of decolonizing the, the space in classrooms so students get liberated. Um, we, we have written cases about this work. And this is, again, to upend the discourse, the counter narrative. Because in the business school, we write cases about fabulous, brilliant, men, mostly men. Now we're writing about women. Um, mainly white and, and, and other groups of, of men who are uh, prototypes of the success stories. And so this work was to, to show the work of indigenous women in Peru, who, by the way, have a very successful business. They sell in New York. And it was another way to create a counter story and to create students. Let me just say something about my indigenous class. So I teach in the indigenous class at SFU. And I knew that what was bouncing in my head as I stepped into that classroom and I have taught it, I was on the steering committee uh, for, my, for, for the entire time it exists. And I knew that as the Audrey Lord says, the master's tool will never dismantle the master's house. How do I take the tools built by the master and hand it to my students and look the other way? I knew that we needed to find space in, the, in light of indigenous, the reality of continued genocide, of dispossession of indigenous people. 
of the trauma that continues of the Indian Act and all the ways in which our my indigenous students show up in the classroom, I had an obligation to create a space that those things would be centered, not peripheral, but centered in the conversation. And so much of the work we do there is an attempt to ensure and also recognize that I am not indigenous, but my students are, and they're experts at their lives. How do I create the space for them to, to feel? And it has everything to do, you have to look at everything, including pedagogy. How do you, what kind of methods you use? How do you create uh, different styles of learning? Because this notion of these silos and lists and things may not be appropriate in knowledge systems that see things more interconnected. And so that's some of the work. I, my undergraduate students, my, my, dean, my associate dean Peter Tinglin is here to attest to the fact that in one of these classes, uh, he got a, he got a, a, a complaint that Black Lives Matter should have nothing to do with the classroom. Um, and so as I, as I brought to the table uh, the work that looks at businesses in Tanzania, in, in Rwanda, often my students are a little taken aback, but I'll tell you at the end of one of these classes, um, I, I, I will share with you the reflections of my students. Incredible. They come in kicking and screaming because here's a, here's a discipline that has taught us that the value of a person is their market worth. So the first thing they want to know is what's the size of Rwanda? Uh, how much are they worth? Why are we learning anything about these people that aren't worth anything, right? And the, we've got to ensure that the roots of our discipline, this is advertising. I didn't paint it myself. This is a kind of racist advertising that has existed. And if our students don't understand that that's the root of some of the things we teach, then we have failed to educate them. We've got to think about Robert Sutherland is at Queen's University, um, one of the most decorated academic and also um, contributor. He graduated in 1852 in classics from Queen's University and, and saved Queen's University from financial ruin. How many people have ever heard his name? A Jamaican, by the way. I'm gonna pick on the senior leadership in the last few couple of slides I have here. If you're gonna emancipate the university, it has to be from the, the leadership have to be central to this. And I, this is not a very good slide, but it's an attempt to show you the, the leadership of the university. We have the president and on the other two sides, we have the board of governors and we have the Senate. And then we have the senior administration, right? These are the critical, always remember that. This is where the money gets moved around. This is where policies are made. And this is where the operational direction comes from. So I'm gonna, I see um, some of the people responsible. Um, the, not, I know Osab isn't here, but others, Balkis is part of this group. The students got done at Senate that nobody else has ever been able. I, I don't even know how you did it. I, you gotta tell these students, I love students. Students have 15 black faculty, fed up of this. And you know what? White, Chinese, South Asian, Arabs, everybody got together and said, none of us had black professors. And you robbed us of this opportunity. And we're going to work with our students. And we're going to get this through. And you remember that, Joy. That was one fierce Senate meeting. My goodness, these students were like whip. Oh my goodness, this was not going to go anywhere. And I'm telling you, they got through something that we've been arguing about with the professoriate. We're going to do this, that, and that. As soon as got that through in six months or a year. I mean, I'm telling you, I love students and I love to see. And, and they remind us, yes. It was incredible. 
let's talk some other time, but we have to do a lot more than just attract faculty now, don't we? And people to the university. They come, they leave because they meet a university that's not, as I have talked earlier, we're allowing them. Let's talk about the Board of Governors. Let me tell you something. I served on the Senate of the university for nine years. So get me when I tell you these are important bodies. And I was usually ignored, uh, not Senate. Senate was actually better because you could get up and give speeches and sway people. And I would try my best to come up with the best oratorial defense I could get of something I wanted in the hopes that I would, at the very worst, best um, get everybody to agree, but at worst, guilt everybody into it, whichever way, I didn't care. But, but the, Senate, the Senate was a body that I could work with. The Board of Governors, on the other hand, was a whole different ballgame. Here you have, a, this is a the University Act puts the, and, and, and they're ordering council, they're appointed to university to protect the independence of the university. And I gotta tell you, let's ask them, how are decisions made? You must see, I want you to all know this, in the mandate letter signed by the board of Simon Fraser University is, a statement about equity and anti-racism. They have committed, the board has said that, right? I want you to hear this because now what are you gonna do about that? Is always a question. How does that actually affect the decisions and the resources, right? And that's what we're gonna be looking for. Where's the, follow the money, eh? Always follow the money. That's what tells you where priorities are. So, We'll be looking for this mandate letter to see exactly how it gets implemented. Senior administration, you see it, we, they celebrate the diversity of people, ideas, and culture. Celebrate. I want to know how and when and why and how are your jobs? How are senior administrators being held to account for the commitments they make in their portfolio. So if they have to make commitments in their portfolio, and then their jobs and, and, and their performance should depend on that. And we're gonna be looking for that. And, and this is across all universities. How are they accountable? Deans, my dean is here. They make five-year academic plans. But I'm gonna just share with you a statement here. I feel compelled. Faculty and uh, staff renewal. I'm gonna read it. Recruit and hire the best faculty and staff while, while supporting SFU's equity and diversity objectives. Do you know why that's there, the while? Because it's a perception that if you're going to have equity and diversity, you're not really hiring the best faculty. That the, 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 the best faculty are not really, it's, it's why. Do you understand what I'm saying? But. It's always this juxtaposition. You have never hired the best faculty because you have ignored diversity and inclusion. So the plan, my dean, commits you. <laughs> <laughs> to do everything you do through the lens of equity and diversity. And I want to know what the plans are. I want to know what the priorities and goals, how it's going to be audited. What are the specific plans? And to stop behind, hiding behind the myth of meritocracy. We've got to engage with racialized communities. And we have to, of course, foster a thriving student body. And I got to get to this picture because Balkis is in this picture. And, and it's again, Space matters. The whole university is designed for somebody else, it seems. That's what our students feel. When I went up to Simon Fraser University, and I'm going to lose you all on this point, it's so trivial, but I'm going to just tell you how universities, why space and the inclusion for students have to feel like they belong. I remember, I've shared this with Joy, that when I went up there and I saw the concrete, I, I thought it wasn't finished. <laughs> I thought they hadn't painted it yet. And I couldn't, I, I was wondering, should I go to a university that doesn't have enough money to paint their university? Because in Jamaica, you would never have concrete 
that, that looks like this if you have any money. And so I remember thinking, there must be a different sensibility to this place. And I, and, and, and I know that you would say, oh, that's so trivial. I recognize it. But I just want you to see how every aspect of a university is built for somebody else. So I know I'm every support, even the, I've gotten, ah, talk about food. I once asked, are we, we're, we're having a black event. We're, we're having black food, right? Huh? Our catering staff was like, what? Are you talking about? And I made a color. Anybody who knows what rice and peas is? No, anybody knows Jamaican rice? Okay. All right, good stuff. I made the colossal error. I said, I want rice and peas. And the day before the event, <laughs> if I can remember this, I come and they said, we're going to put the rice in this dish and the peas in this dish. <laughs> and if you don't know, you look it up. Because of course, you know what I mean? Like the foods are designed for some group. And, and I remember my poor African student telling me they're trying to make jollof rice and it was just disastrous. I mean, we have to, people need to feel, this is the whole thing needs to be thought about. And I, I, and I know you might think that it's trivial, but it just tells us how deep seated it is in every aspect of the university experience. And I won't go into that, but I will say, um, the, the one before said, and then we need to ask if universities can be saved. I think we actually have to ask that question. And I, if you have a chance, read about Padilla, who, who challenged the classics at a conference and said, uh, he teaches at Princeton, he said, I don't think the classics can be saved. It's all about these white men who, who, who think the Europeans were the only civilized people. You think we can actually have a discipline out of this? And of course you can imagine what happened to him. But I ask, can universities be saved? I think we have to actually ask, is it fundamentally um, em emancipatable? Um, but I think it is, maybe because I've spent so much of my life here, I've got to believe it. And I'm even wearing my colors today. Um, but on, only if we are all prepared to topple the edifices um, and reimagine them. Um, and maybe then I invite all of us because the songs of freedom can only be sung when we bring the entire community in the space of innovation. Lords, uh, Audrey Lords talk about this quite a bit. Differences matter. It's not to take away our differences, it's to, and no, nor tolerate it, but to bring it into a space of true innovation and inclusion so that the university can thrive for all of us. Uh, and thank you very much. And I'm really sorry I took this long. That was fantastic, June. Um, I, I wanna thank you very, very much for your passion, um, but also for you know uh, a, a fantastic, evidence-informed um, in all of its forms um, presentation that was deeply moving, um, personal, um, but also held a mirror up to us. And I think that's what we all need as well is um, for, for us to have a, a mirror held up to think about uh, the challenges that lie ahead. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so we have 15 minutes. I know. <laughs> I love working with you and I kind of knew this was going to happen. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, it, the, the task does feel large. You know, the, the, the university is, the canon of the university is so embedded in Eurocentrism and our structures are so, it, it's even, it's like trying to be up against the Empire State Building and see it. You can't see it even sometimes. So I think, you know, uh, some of your suggestions about, you know, cracking open um, um, the canon, um, teaching in different ways, different forms of knowledge can help all of us. But I'm just wondering, you know, for, for all of us in the room tonight, you know, if we were, what, what's our marching orders here? What do we need to be thinking about? You know, what are some of the critical things we need to think about right now? So I think one of the critical things is to accept this and to understand it. I think there is a lot of resistance to this. And I know where that resistance is coming from. We all 
are mental slaves to a system that has taught us these things. And it's hard to accept that the investment we have made in our education and the way we see the world is, is being attacked in this way. It's a difficult thing. It's a difficult thing. I even personally, it means that I with four degrees have to accept that much of that has denied me the privilege of understanding so much about the world. So I think if we could just calmly and reflectively think about it and recognize from the point of view of the excluded, but also from our own perspective, is this the Canada that we want? Is this the university that we want? Is this the space that we want to inhabit? So that's the first thing I think is acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. But I do think it, it, it requires challenging some deeply held institutional norms. Deeply held. So I do think that leadership matters. And so holding boards of governors, holding the government and its mandate, holding joy, senior leadership, to ensuring that they start to right the ship becomes important. I, 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 and I, it's really about investing in different ways. We have so deeply invested only in one set of ideas and one group of people. So we got to blow that up a little bit. No, we have to blow it up. We got to throw something into that water because people are swimming in a, 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 a lake. Uh, and, and, and the fish are not noticing the water. And sometimes you've got to throw in a diamond and it blows it up. You notice I'm no longer in water because I think it, the change has to be truly fundamental. And I know that it would take a lot more to go into specifics, but I do think leadership matters. You know, I, I agree too. And in many ways, this is why I asked you to come alongside and, and work with me because I need help as well. I mean, I really like this idea of epistemic ignorance because I, it asks the question as well. How do we know what we don't know? Like right. you can't even get there. You know, how, you need people around you to help you see what you're not seeing, right? So that's why we need June Francis's in our lives to help us kind of think about that. But we also take our knowledge systems for granted as well. Yeah. I'm really quite taken with that, right? In terms of all of the knowledge systems that we're not taking advantage of within the academy and how much more we could benefit if we opened it up. That is what I find most incredible is that we uh, have ignored uh, the vast, you know, you think about the, the kingdoms in, in, and, the, and the knowledge systems that were destroyed by, you just look at the Benin sculptures, but more than that, from the way in which colonization erased and did not take stock of so much of the world that we don't know anything about the great traditions in Asia. You think about the middle, you know, you just have to go around the world and realize. And then when we bring those knowledge systems in, guess what we do? We call them area studies. So you can speak, you can go and study over here in Middle Eastern studies, but real studies is in the middle, right? Those are the things on the periphery. Those are special interests, but what is normal and what's universal is us. And so, yes, we have denied ourselves. And I think we should be angry about that. When I say acknowledge it, I think we should also be, if you really believe that, you should also be quite angry that we have taught you more and more about less and less. I am gonna remind people in the audience and online that we can ask questions through Slido. And um, so Slido, uh, here we go, everybody. It's all, you go to the website, sli.do, and there's the six digit code. I've got a lot of questions in front of me already. You can vote them up. Uh, I'm only gonna be taking questions on Slido. If you don't have Slido, I'm sorry. I'm gonna ask you to whisper it into someone's ear and they can vote it up as well. We only have 10 minutes. So let me get to the first question here. And I feel like this is a question for me, not you, June. Okay, so yeah. answer, you can answer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like that. 
So what targets are actually set at SFU for achieving diversity of all kinds? Are there indicators for measuring progress? How will we know when we have succeeded? Any thoughts? I love that. Yeah, it's a great question, yeah. isn't it? You know, and it's been, a str I'm gonna tell you, you know, my story on this one, it's been a struggle because we don't even have good demographic data, basic demographic data on our faculty and staff. If you ask me, um, you know, for, for numbers on who identifies as BIPOC at our university, I don't have the, the data. So there's a project started, and I know uh, Scarborough Charter is going to be talking about this as well. Like I think we're struggling with how to meaningfully collect that data, um, and uh, looking for looking for some breakthroughs there because that is going to be very essential for us. And then to set targets. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about targets. I like targets. <laughs> I got to tell you, I've learned that that's the only way this particular in institutional structure in this time and place. I wish they didn't need to be there, but that's the only way to hold people to account. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think that um, we do need to set targets. I think we need to, and not just targets around, targets Representation around is the least of it, Exactly, but it exists. We need to, as you can tell, we don't, <laughs> of course, we need people who bring their worldview and their intellectual traditions and knowledge into this space. So we need way more uh, uh, groups of people in our, in our universities. But it's not just numbers of people. If you don't change the fundamental way, uh, I am here, I could, let me just tell you this. As a black person, don't assume that I wasn't educated to be mentally slave to the same systems. I was taught the same thing. I can recite poems from Wordsworth any day of the week you want, okay? I know every parish in England. I don't know the ones in my own country, but do I know the ones in Europe? So I'm just saying that just because we're here, if you don't change the way you open up to make us do the kind of research and teaching and pedagogy and redress the exclusion of knowledge, you will end up at the same place. It's so interesting because that really addresses that second question there. How can universities do a better job of not representing Eurocentric ideologies as objective singular truths, right? Like it is about cracking open um, yeah. Yeah, what is considered knowledge, right? right? And I do think there's some progress. I mean, I think there's some interest in land-based learning, um, other approaches, creative, creative methodologies, but we're just, we're tinkering. But, but you're just at the surface and it's yeah. all, and it's, take it seriously. You see, most people think, oh, that's kind of like, oh yes, we should allow those people over there to do the land-based thing. Yeah. Or yeah, it's cute that they're doing art-based <laughs> yeah. learning. But the real soul, I've had, I'd have a professor say to me, but I teach physics. What does this have to do with me? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, my instinct at the time was just to say, I just came back from Machu Picchu. Do you not understand the physics of that? Uh, and, and she said, I said, where is Machu Picchu? But the, the thing is that it, it's a way in which people think the hard, what they call the hard science. Algorithms bake in inequality, right? They're designed. Science was always designed to experiment on certain people and benefit others and use only some techniques. We know the double blind, we know a few other things. Do we know anything else? No. No, we could go on on that one for yeah. sure. Henrietta Lacks, for example. Yeah, so many examples. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Maybe just uh, one or two more. We'll see where we get here. Uh, what, uh, how can, we've done that one. As a department chair at SFU, and I like this, it, it's interesting. I'm finding it really hard to implement EDI and decolonize without resources. Uh, do you have suggestions um, for how we can advance this work in the absence of funds from our deans to hire new faculty and redevelop our curriculum? I think it's, it's pointing to the structural deficit yeah, that we're experiencing that, right now. Yeah. yeah, so first of all, we have invested in only some people and the way universities work, they're gonna be here for a long time. So the first thing is to recognize that they're not being held accountable. When is the faculty being held accountable for research that addresses in their own studies, how, how racism and, and indigenous exclusion and dispossession? How is that showing up in, how can you get tenure if you can't demonstrate this ability? How can you get regarded as a good teacher if you, you know only such few ideas? How does the dean get rewarded if his faculty continues this epistemic 
uh, uh, violence in this university. So we need to start to embed in everything we do a requirement that this is a competence that is absolutely baseline. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I am curious, I'm gonna interject a Joy Johnson question. You, you know, some of, the, some of the pushback we get though is around academic freedom. Right? I mean, that becomes the trope that gets utilized to push back against this, that you know, professors have the freedom to study what they want. And um, so you know, you know, don't, you know, don't, don't try to influence me in my area of study. So it, 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 it's a challenge, right? To kind of- So first of all, we're not free. I totally Because agree. of white yeah. research complex. And I wanna say this, there is a white research industrial complex. The reviewers, the, ten, the people who write tenure letters, all of that and constrain the freedom of most of people that look like me and try to do my work. So this myth that there's academic freedom, it's freedom uh, of hegemony, of power of the people who have built up a certain repertoire. So, so we don't have academic freedom. And so the question now becomes, but we, we you, the question is a good one. How do we undo this? Well, tripartite uh, granting agencies are a good one. We get grant, the grants that we get, what is the requirement in there to demonstrate the competency? We, we, we have to demonstrate all kinds of competence. It's not like they hand us the money. We just have to wake up and they say, give us money. We have to constrain ourselves to the white industrial complex to get our money. Yeah. Uh, so why can't, so shift in that, right? Can make an enormous difference to what people put and, and, and invest in. But let me make this clear. This should not be a moment for, for academics of power to say, oh yes, we're gonna add that to our repertoire on a trivial way so that we can continue to get all the money. Cause that's the instinct. This is the instinct of power. So we'll get all these graduate students from around the world and we'll suck out their knowledge and then we'll write more papers in this area, right? And that we must resist. It's a transfer of that power to the real expert, to the people you have excluded. So I think th this is another place where they need to be held account. Yeah. Not how have you extracted the knowledge from other people and gained power for, your, for yourself, but how have you brought into the center of power other people? Yeah, well. Uh, the, which one are you looking at? I, yeah, so I, I think that's what June was talking about. As a department chair at SFU, I'm finding it hard to implement EDI and without the resources, right? That's the- And I'm saying- Oh, you want me to answer the question? Yeah, I mean, I think that we are at a moment right now where we are gonna have to align resources and we have a brand new vice, people, vice president, people equity and inclusion joining us April 17th, Yabom. Gilpin Jackson, um, we are creating an EDI office at the university. We recognize tools and training are required. There is work to be done and no shortage of it. And I recognize, I mean, this is why, you know, I asked June, June to work alongside me. There is work to be done. Uh, and so the thing for me, you know, Henry, is we can't shy away from it. We just have to lean in as best we can, figure out how we can resource it and start to move forward. And I think we've made some strides. Certainly, but certainly more work to be done. Yeah, and it's not that I'm not acknowledging we make strides, okay? I, I just don't wanna do that thing where a little bit that, yeah. that we reward a little bit of effort. You know how it's always like, I, did, I, I didn't say something terrible, so I'm a good person. No, you're, you've, done, you've just kind of getting decent or, or not horrible. <laughs> Yeah. So, so, so now we have a long way to go from where we're at, right? Yeah, we got, we um, took 400 years to get here. It's going to yeah. take a little while to get out of it. It's, and uh, that again, you know, it's going to take a little while, but we can't allow 400 years, right? Yeah. So, so now we have to got, sorry, you know, Joe, I'm going to come back and say, so we got to get that learning going on a steep journey. Yeah, no, and, and I, the other thing is, I, I, I totally appreciate, you know, you're holding me accountable and I am accountable, but we need everyone to lean yes. in. Yes. This is about a culture change at our institution and it yeah. is about everybody leaning in. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I've better. seen you lean in, but it requires, you know, what's the board of governors doing, you know? What are they doing when you go in with your proposal? They're hiding behind all kinds of things. 
we need to understand very transparently. And let me remind you of why we don't collect data, because Canada, by not collecting data, the problem doesn't exist. We don't have to have charts like that showing how many Black and Indigenous staff you have. If you don't know, then it doesn't exist. So it's not also by accident we don't collect data. The lack of data is a reflection of a purposeful strategy to disguise and obscure the ways in which people have been excluded. But I agree. Let me just say, we're all in this, and, and, but we should be anxious for change. I think we need to be. Well, I think, June, um, you can sense that we are anxious for change, you know, um, uh, and I really appreciate your passion, enthusiasm, and call to action. I think that's really important for all of us at SFU and actually the broader community to think about our responsibilities. And I certainly take your holding me accountable seriously as well. Uh, we are past eight o'clock, um, and I do want to deeply, deeply thank you for closing out um, this series in such a passionate and really... Um, just, uh, I, I've learned a lot and I really do deeply, deeply appreciate it. So please join me once again in thanking uh, Dr. Jean Francis. <laughs>